Hello everybody and welcome again to another episode on the cat skeletal system and we will now be proceeding to the next division of the skeletal system which would be the appendicular skeletal system. And with me today to help discuss this portion of the skeletal system is my good friend Lucky B. Hey, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. So Lucky B actually knows a thing or two about cat bones. So from time to time we're going to be swapping places as we talk about the bones of the cat. Sounds good? Sound good to me? You want to start? Sure, okay, no problem. The appendicular skeletal system, from the word append, which means to attach. And where are they attached? They attach to the actual skeletal system. And this is further subdivided into two general parts, which would be, okay, we have the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. The pectoral girdle refers to the set of bones that are attached to maybe the thoracic region or to the chest region of the animal. And that would be your scapula, your coracoids, the clavicles, and the associated forelimbs. And the pelvic girdle will be the one that's attached to the, the lower part of the torso or the more caudal part of the torso, which would be the pelvic bones and the associated hind limbs. Let's start. This part right here, that is the shoulder blade or the scapula. This next long bone is the humerus or the upper arm, also known as your brachium. This one will be your forearm, which is composed of two bones. This longer bone right here with this very nice deep notch, that is the ulna. This shorter bone that sort of crosses and twists in front of it, that is the radius. This is the manus or the paw of your cat. Should we go with the scapula? Yeah, I think scapula, go, go, we go start. So we're looking right now at scapula. And you notice the scapula is a relatively flat bone. Now disregard this hole. I think this may have come from a mounted specimen. And so they maybe have a wire go through here so that they can mount it. So also this hole here, this hole here, those do not exist naturally. I'll show you the left scapula. That's kind of how it looks like, but this one has some cracks maybe students were dissecting this bone they sort of cut it because scapular bone very thin and very flat you look the normal orientation of scapula when your cat is alive kind of look like this this is the dorsal side or the vertebral side this is the cranial side the one facing the front this one is the one facing the back and this one the one facing ventrally the one that facing you right now up here this is the lateral side and then the one here at the other side, that is the medial side. First, this entire region right here with all these bumps and all of that and this articulating part, this part generally called the apex of the scapula. This part, because it's toward the anterior side, this is also known as the anterior or the cranial border of your scapula. This one is obviously the dorsal border or the vertebral border because it's closest to the vertebrae and then this one is the axillary or the caudal border because it's facing towards the posterior side axillary because it kind of like close to the maybe like the armpit of your cat that's why it's axillary because another term for armpit is the axilla another very prominent feature of your scapula running sort of in the middle and that is the scapular spine or the spine of your scapula and the spine of your scapula have this part right here like that angle right there right that is called the tuberosity of the spine and then you move further ventrally you're gonna see the two process right here that is known as the uh, chromion process and then this one is the metachromion process some they just call this a chromion process metachromion process but others they say whole thing is a chromion this is hamate and then this is suprahamate. I guess both are acceptable. At the very end of the apex, it's very smooth and rounded. This is known as the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. This is your upper arm, so they kind of articulate like that, see? Your shoulder kind of like ball and socket joint, so it has wide range of movement. And what's that little thing that we see right there? That is known as the coracoid process and then you also have this part this is the supra glenoid tubercle and then this one is the infra glenoid tubercle coracoid is in the medial side it's this one but this one is what we call the supra glenoid tubercle 
and then this one here is the infraglenoid tubercle. You call this the supraspinous fossa, and then this one below the spine is infraspinous fossa. This entire thing is known as the subscapular fossa. This would be the humerus, and this would be the ulna, the one that I'm holding right now, and the, the shorter bone next to it is the radius. And this would be the forearm bone or the antebrachium. These are both long bones. And for long bones in general, you have a proximal end. When we say proximal, it's closer to the center of mass. And the farther it gets away from the body or away from the center of mass, that is the distal end. For your humerus, this is the proximal end. This is the distal end. For your radius and ulna, since they kind of attach like that, this is more proximal and this is more distal. In general, long bones will have, of course, this entire part would be the shaft. When you're looking at the humerus, what am I looking at? What side am I facing at? This side is actually the anterior side. So this part is the one that's facing forward. Where the head is, that would be the posterior side. It has this hole, which we will talk about later, and that is always situated medially. This bone that I am looking at right now, because this is the anterior side and this is the medial side, I know that this bone is the right humerus. Head of the humerus, greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity. In some others, the greater tuberosity, this top part would also be described as the crest of the greater tuberosity. If you look at it anteriorly, that's kind of how they look like greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity. In between those, there's kind of like a groove here, and that is known as the bicipital groove. In other texts, they will also point this kind of nub here, kind of right below the greater tuberosity, and that would be the teres minor tuberosity. Now for the shaft of your bone, you're actually going to feel a lot of ridges, so it's not a round cylindrical shape when you cut it in cross-section. The most prominent ones that we have would be the one running down here anteriorly. That is the pectoral ridge. Up at the side, right here, is the deltoid ridge. They kind of meet somewhere here, and that is what we call the deltoid tuberosity. Another feature along the shaft of your bone is this part. If we look at it posteriorly and laterally, this is going to be your brachial groove. Moving to the distal part of your humerus, this is the trochlea, which is located medially. This is the capitulum. The trochlea will articulate with the ulna, and the capitulum will articulate with the radius. Even more medial to your trochlea is this bump right here, which is the medial epicondyle. Next to the capitulum is this bump right here. That is the lateral epicondyle. Your lateral epicondyle, if you actually feel the bone, this kind of crest or ridge here, that is the lateral epicondyle crest. You're also going to see this hole here, which is called the supracondyloid foramen. This would be the olecranon fossa. This part right here would be the radial fossa, and this sort of shallower dip here would be the coronoid fossa. This next bone right here we see is the forearm bone, or also known as your antebrachium, and they're made of two main bones. The longer bone is the ulna, the shorter bone is the radius. And how they articulate with humerus, trochlea interact with ulna, and then capitulum of your humerus interact with radius. Right now we look at it anteriorly, and you will notice that orientation of bone is quite unusual, because the radius, it comes from lateral side, and then it twists over the ulna in front of the ulna to the medial side. The radius kind of pull forward, cross over the ulna anteriorly until it get to the medial side. Let's have a look at the radius. How do you orient? This one is the more proximal end. This one is the more distal end. This is anterior view. This one is the more medial side. And then this one is the posterior view. You will know because you will feel this, this bump right here. That is in the posterior side. Always just remember that the longest projection at the distal end of your radius, that is always the medial side. That's kind of how I remember it. This is the head of the radius. At the side of your head, there is what we call articular circumference. Why it called articular circumference? Because remember that it stick next to the ulna. There you go, that part that touched the ulna. 
that is the articular circumference. So it's not like straight, it kind of becomes a bit narrow. The narrow part is called the neck. There's this big bump here that is located posteriorly. This is known as the radial tuberosity or the bicipital tuberosity. And then when we move to the more distal end of the bone, the most distal projection you will find that is called the medial styloid process. Along the shaft of your bone, kind of feels like a ridge or a crest. You call that intraosseous crest. So why intraosseous? Because when you look at both the radius ulna together, that's the part where they stick together. You see? This time, let's talk about the ulna. The notch faces anteriorly. It always faces forward. Remember that the radius starts from lateral and then it twists over to become medial. So you know that the notch where the radius sits, that is going to be at the lateral side. The most proximal bump, this is known as the olecranon or the olecranon. There's going to be this dip here, which is the semilunar or the trochlear notch. This is the one that articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. Some would also sort of label this bump right here above your semilunar notch as your anconial process, but others don't bother with it. Olecranon or the tuber olecranon or the olecranon process, anconial process, semilunar notch, radial notch at this side. The radial notch has the medial coronoid process and the lateral coronoid process, but if not, you can just point this as the coronoid process. So if your radius has an intraosseous crest, then your ulna also has an intraosseous crest where it kind of meets with the intraosseous crest of your radius. The lateral styloid process, or you can just call it the styloid process. So that's the most distal projection that you have. And those would be the parts of the ulna. This one is the left paw because you see these bones, that's kind of like the thumb bone, like when a cat put its paw on the ground, you know that this part located medially. For the manus, you generally divide it into three main regions, which will be your wrist bones, otherwise known as your carpals, your metacarpals, and then the bones of your digits, which we call the phalanges, or other call these phalanges. Your carpal bones, this one will interact with the styloid processes of your radius and your ulna. This biggest bone right here, known as the scapholuna or intermediate radial or the scapholuinate bone. Right next to that, that is the ulnare, also known as cuneiform or triketral bone. And then here at the back, that is known as the pisiform or the accessory carpal bone. So the next row below that, those would be the next row of your wrist bone. Let's work our way from the most medial to the most lateral. Greater multangular, also known as the trapezium. This one, which is the lesser multangular, also known as the trapezoid bone. This one is the capitate, and then this one is the hamate. The rest of the parts are pretty easy. This one, these are your metacarpals. They don't eat, ha, really have special name, just one, two, three, four, five. And then for your phalanges, you have your proximal phalanges, these long ones. The next one is the middle phalanges. So the ones where the claws are, those are your distal phalanges. If you strip off the keratin sheath, there's this sort of process that still kind of look like claw. This one is called the unguicular process. When you clip the claws of your dogs and cat, you be careful. It can be very painful for your cat or your dog and that's why they get mad at you when you try to clip way too far in. It's going to hurt because remember bone inside, they make new red blood cell. That means that that part is vascularized so it can bleed. How about those, those little nubs right there? that you see that aren't really ph phalanges, but they aren't really part of the metacarpals either. So those, we call those sesamoid bones. Maybe because they look like sesame seeds. And that's it, we are done. We are done with the pectoral girdle and the associated forelimbs. For the next episode, we're gonna be talking about the pelvic girdles and the associated hind limbs. So watch out for that. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you all have a great time ahead studying the bones. Have fun. See you soon. Hey, wait, 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 wait. What? <laughs> I have joke. What you call that hole in the scapula? What? In the human induced foramen. <laughs> because human put the hole there. So it's human induced foramen. 
What is the funniest bone in the body? Is it the humerus? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's the humerus because it's so humorous. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. Oh, because it's so humorous, right? <laughs> Can you please stop it?